problem with determinism is it says uh, everything can't happen anyway except the way that it's happening. Now, the problem with that is that it makes the concept of thinking irrelevant <laughs> because you're thinking what you're thinking because you couldn't think anything else. Therefore, the notion of truth or, or uh, judgment or all of that is completely shot down. So a totally determined universe is the most ultimately uninteresting that there can be. Uh, nevertheless, the universe clearly is, to some degree, highly determined. I mean, we know to within nanoseconds the time of the sunrise tomorrow, and uh, unless there's a serious instability, it will be on time. So there is a degree of predictability. Um, my rap is sort of divided into two parts, and I'm very shy about the second half. The first half is easy for me. It's that psychedelics are wonderful, you should take them, this is the way to save the world, so forth and so on. The second part of the rap is, here's what I've learned from psychedelics, and then not some general kind of feel-good thing, but something that requires a blackboard and tensor equations of the third degree and so forth and so on. And I'm very shy about putting that out. My personal approach to psychedelics before I realized that you could save the world with them, when I just thought that this was some kind of thing, self-exploration, my notion was what it's good for is ideas. It's for generating ideas. And I don't really like the word generating because you don't generate them, you hunt them. You get in your little boat and you paddle out onto the dark water and then, you know, you put your feet up and you wait and you set your nets and you wait and, uh, you know, Sometimes you pull up your nets and something the size of a freight train has gone through them and you just row for sure, shit in <laughs> white. And sometimes, you know, minnows, trivia, you know, why, do, why does our little finger just fit our nostril? And, you know, the, the mysteries of the animal body or all kinds of stuff. But occasionally, and it's worth fishing a lifetime, you know, occasionally something will come into the nets that is not so small as to be trivial and not so large as to be incomprehensible. And this thing can be wrestled with for hours and eventually brought home to show the startled folks back on shore. And this showing the startled folks back on shore is, uh, makes history. All these ideas come out of interaction with these plants. Uh, the number of ideas which when you pick up a straight encyclopedia are should be traced back to uh, herders and people who kept animals. People say, you know, astrology, astronomy, it was invented by people watching their flocks. The calendar, time, was invented by people watching their flocks. All this other, well, they weren't only watching their flocks, they were also watching the uh, cow pies of their flocks for mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, music, all of these Pythagorean insights into order, I think, come out of uh, this, this herding, domesticated animal husbandry, we call it husbandry, because it's a model of caring for nature. And... Um, these ideas are the inspiration and the purpose, to my mind. I mean, the, the social purpose. Because I can, you know, get rid of my stuff and feel better about how I was abused in childhood and this and that and the other thing with psychedelics. But that's all personal growth stuff. But an idea you know, can be shared. You can take it and you can lay it at somebody's feet. There, and, uh, and where do they come from? You know, when you ask the question, where do the ideas come from? This is Platonic Philosophy 101, ladies and gentlemen. This is why the Greeks gave up fishing. 
to discuss this problem. Where do the ideas come from? And we are no closer to understanding that. And yet, the ideas are the signposts of our destiny. They guide us forward. And yet, we know not from whence nor whither. Well, I think now, uh, you know, so Plato's take on that was he said, well, there must be a perfect world somewhere where all these things exist in some, and the numbers and everything, there's a perfect form for everything in a higher dimensional world called the archetypes. Well, 2,000 years of, of uh, philosophical sophistication have shown certain problems with that point of view, but fewer than you might think. I mean, the mystery of form, the problem of form, what is it? Where does it come from? What sustains it? We are nothing more than form. If it weren't for form, we would be no different than the dirt under our feet. And form intrudes into matter, and then it withdraws. And when it withdraws, they put you in a hole and put dirt on top of you. So you know, it's very important to understand what is this coming and going of form. If we take this pillow and saw it in two, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty undramatic event. If we take one of us and saw us in two, it's an extremely dramatic event. And what is the difference there? It's that this object is three-dimensional, and this object is four-dimensional. This object has a quality about it called being alive. Being alive, also technically known as metabolism, means that material is moving along temporal gradients within the confines of this organism. Material is not moving along any gradients within this thing. It's just where it is. There it sits. But in here, a form is being maintained from within. And if I were to die, the form would collapse. Here, no form is being maintained except the form imposed. This is an imposed form. It has no sense of itself, and it doesn't sustain itself from any kind of internal integrity. But higher dimensional objects, like animals, and plants, and human beings, have this quality. Well, so then what we've been talking about here, uh, albeit sloppily, is uh, the fact that we seem to occupy a higher dimension in the natural order than other things. And this higher dimension has to do with the fact that we have a little piece of mind, a little chunk of this higher order organization. Well then, going toward that, as visionaries, as users of psychedelics, society keeps um, adjusting its trim tabs, as it were, to mirror this transcendental goal. And this is what we want to become. We want to become like the sensed object in our imagination. And shamanism is a pipeline about this. It's almost as though the, the end state... Well, here's, here's a model for it. It's almost as though the ordinary causal flow of information from the past to the future must make a place for like a 3 to 5% backward flow. And this is what we call intuition. It's that vague, unformed knowing that comes without any baggage of causal mechanism, but, it te but it's true knowledge. You know how it's going to be. Well, it may be that, that time is somehow information permeable, that future potential states of existence are actually somehow in resonance with states of existence in the present and in the past. Our models of how the world works are very, very simple. I mean, basically, we operate with mechanical push-pull uh, uh, models that are appropriate to very simple mechanical systems. And yet we know that we are far more complex even than uh, you know, the most complex physical systems. Like this, this last 15,000 years has been something. And the last 500 years 
has really been something. It's so close now, the transcendental object, that it informs everything. The, the, me- the metaphor, the model to hold on in your mind as you gaze at, uh, at the earth in its travail is the metaphor of birth, not death, that uh, a gestation process of 20,000 years is coming to an end. Culture using, language using, minded uh, creatures are coming to some kind of uh, fermentative climax. And we cannot extrapolate the human career on this planet centuries into the future. It ain't going to be like that. It, it, it's an absurd question to ask the question, what will the, what will the world be like in 500 years? What the world will be like in 500 years is unimaginable because in the next 40 years we are going to pass through this quantized transition where we actually become insiders and players in the game. History is a state of becoming. It's a state of moving from the inarticulate, unreflecting, animal style of organization to the self-reflecting, minded, conscious, energy-controlling style. But to get from one to the other takes about 20,000 years, and it's a bitch. You don't know where you are. You don't know up from down. You cannot tell what is happening. There's just migrations and warfare and pogroms and gene mixing and hysteria of every sort and Messiah this and religion that and they're slaughtering these people and these people are doing that. And it's like a bad dream. It's like a psychedelic trip, is what it's like. It's a fifteen to 25,000 year dash to authentic being from the animal body. And it would have been a lot easier to understand if 10,000 years ago we hadn't cut the telephone wire to nature. Because from then on we haven't been able to figure out what's going on. And it's been left to men with large egos to figure out what was going on. And what they figured out was going on was that there was a lot of free women, land, animals, and money that needed to be organized for their pleasure. Because they lost the connection to this planetary birth process. Now, uh, and like a birth process, I mean, the metaphor is worth pursuing because... A birth is violent, blood is shed, there's moaning and groaning and thrashing around, and yet this is not uh, an automobile accident, this is not a human tragedy, this is how life works. This is centrally scripted in to how human beings operate. If this didn't happen, we wouldn't be here. Well, that's the, and yet, you know, if you've ever been pregnant or been around a pregnant person, this is a wonderful state of equilibrium, of self-satisfaction, of completion, and yet it, the very fact that it exists ensures that it's going to be rent, it's going to be torn, it's going to end violently in separation of these two beings. But then there are all kinds of births. There's still birth the most disturbing and unsettling of all. There's, you know, breach, there's caesarean, there's bad presentation, there's all, there's easy labors, hard labors. And I think this is the choice that we are, we still have some choices left. And a choice still to be made is, is it going to be a hard labor or an easy labor? It's how fast we educate ourselves. That's the lubrication in the birth canal of this pup. How fast we educate ourselves. Are we going to fight it? Or are we going to go with it? And it's... It's... Really frightening. I mean, because what we want is, first of all, forgiveness for what we've done, which ain't likely to come. And then we want to go back and paint ourselves blue and be tribal and turn our back on all of this. But I don't think it's going to be like that. It's propelling us to some kind of higher order. 
I, the faith is that history must have been for something and that uh, everything is to be knitted together and everything is to be reborn anew. And I don't think this is, a, this is not a religious doctrine exactly. It's more like a, the biological faith. I mean, we see it everywhere. We see it in the birth that I was just describing. We see it in the metamorphosis of insects. Uh, you know, Heraclitus said, Pantit Rea, all flows. And I think that this is the, the hardest thing to learn. It certainly has been the hardest thing for me to learn in my life. And I assume then, by extrapolation, maybe this is one of the hard things to come to terms with. Everything flows. Nothing lasts. I mean, not the travail, not the horror, you know, not the women you love, not the women who drive you crazy, not the children you love, not the children that drive you crazy. Everything is in the process of changing into something else, even at the very moment that you recognize its, uh, its uh, coherence as an entity. And this is the bad news that the ego doesn't want to hear. This is what the ego is created to deny. Because the ego is, you know, it's the effort of flesh to make diamond. And it can't be done. You cannot make an indestructible, adamantine, clear substance. It can't be done. But uh, it's all tied up with our fear of death. You know, we s assume that if we release ourselves into this flow, we will be swept away. That our identity will cease to exist. That we will somehow not be there. This is a, an artifact of language. It's a horrible misunderstanding about who we are and how, uh, how the whole system is working. Are you using language as a meta word <coughs> more than just a syntactic, you know, some words that we're using? Well, no, that's all I mean. But I'm really aware of what a funny thing it is. You know, you talk about other dimensions. Language is like an informational creature of some sort. I mean, languages live, they reproduce themselves. It's a virus. Yes, it's a kind of virus. William Burroughs said this. Yeah. He said English is a virus from outer space. I have no quarrel with this. This mm -hmm. seems entirely reasonable. Um, it, it, it's a very strange thing. Reality is made out of language. And for most of the people in this room, it's made out of English. And yet we spend a great deal of time worrying about quarks and, and <clears throat> mu mesons and electromagnetic radiation. And it, all this is entirely a fiction. None of this stuff exists. All that exists are words. And we play a game, a really fairly insidious game with ourselves. We all, I suppose here, give great credence to what is called quantum physics. Is there anyone here who would care to explain to the group uh, several of the core doctrines of quantum <laughs> physics? Or any core doctrine? And by explain, I don't mean a verbal gloss. I mean give us the hardcore equations. Well, I, no one seems to be coming forth. And yet, this is our truth. How crazy are you if your truth is something you can't even understand? And that's the situation that we're in. We believe that somewhere among us, somebody understands these tensor equations of the third degree. And that if it got real tight, we could go to them and they would then explain what reality is. Well, this is a head full of shit, this kind of thinking. What you are actually dealing with is what Wittgenstein called the present at hand. The present at hand. Good phrase, because it, it implies that only that which can be grasped matters. 
and the quark cannot be grasped, the mu meson, the electromagnetic field, none of this. These things need to be understood for what they are, which is little shingles, little shingles, which we epoxy on to the face of the universal mystery. And once you have a bunch of these little shingles epoxied onto the face of the mystery, then you can't see the mystery at all anymore, <laughs> and you call that an explanation. You say, well, that's taken care of. We've explained it. By the time a child is eight or nine or five or six, they have covered the entirety of reality with these interlocking little linguistic tiles. And nowhere now is reality to be found between ourselves and reality as quickly as we possibly can, we erect a, a lie. We erect a false set of assumptions that are culture-bound. And this has always impressed me, the culture-bound nature of language, that in a way you can never leave the place you're raised in because you acquire a local language. And the local language is all you ever really have. Mm. I had an experience of this that brought it home to me very strongly because when I first went to the tropics, um, I was there as a professional butterfly collector and it was pretty important to make a living. And, uh, and uh, my impression of the jungle was that it was green. That was my impression. Well, then three years later, I went back with botanists. Well, if you know anything about botany and taxonomy, what it is, is it's, a, it's an orgy of language. I mean, you know, leaves are lanceolate, uh, crenolate, they have bracts which are sessile, umbilate, and indentified, and so forth and so on. These are specialized words to describe structure. You go with a botanist into the jungle, and the jungle becomes unbelievably rich. Here are melanostomes, malfigs, varolas, uh, all kinds of things. And as soon as you put words to it, reality emerges. So you see, here is language as a double-edged sword. Out of the undifferentiated, it creates miraculous new realities to which we immediately habituate undervalue and profane. In other words, familiarity breeds contempt. But somewhere between silence and the familiarity that breeds contempt is the living essence of the word and its meaning. This problem of language is uh, central, I think, to understanding uh, the psychedelic experience. What I see happening on these tryptamines is the project of language goes from being something which you hear to something which you see without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition. Well, this is to my mind absolutely astonishing and I think I'm a pretty tough nut to crack. When you see language your your it's amazing because it's a paranormal thing or it's like it's it cheats it achieves paranormal intensity without violating any of the laws of physics that i'm familiar with what i'm talking about is that in these shamanic performances in the amazon and on psilocybin uh, language goes from something beheld to something seen. Uh, there's precedent for this. In the Hellenistic world of, of Greco-Romanism, the be-all and the end-all of spiritual accomplishment was what's called the Logos. And the Logos was an informing voice, a voice in the head that told you the right way to live. And Plato and all of these heavies cultivated and achieved connection with the Logos. Well, there was a, a Alexandrine Jew named Philo Judaeus who was a great commentator on the religions of his period. And he wrote uh, about what he called the more perfect Logos. 
the more perfect logos and he said what is the more perfect logos and then he answered his own question the more perfect logos goes from being heard to being seen without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition language is something unfinished in us it's something that was catalyzed out of animal organization by hallucinogenic activation of brain states and it is something that is in the act of perfecting itself and when it is completed my faith is that words will be seen not heard the whole way in which we organize our language around visual metaphors when we talk about clarity so if someone is able to communicate we say she spoke clearly that's a visual metaphor we say i see what you mean i see what you mean that means i understand you i see what you mean he painted a picture it means unconsciously at the unconscious level we connect visual metaphors and the visual sense with clarity of understanding and what's happening in the ayahuasca cults in the mushroom intoxications and so forth is an invocation of the visible logos it comes into being in the shared space you control it with sound i mean you you discover that sound is something that you can see and this is i referred to this this morning and when i talked about how we may be a one gene mutation away from a transformation of language you can sit feel perfectly normal not feel wired or depressed not have visual activity in the visual field and then you generate a tone like and you see that it's a certain shade of lemon yellow with a chartreuse edge running on it and then you and it shifts to pink blue well you begin to experiment with this and you discover very quickly that you can do more than just generate colors you can generate modalities you can generate shapes as you begin to relax into an unconscious expression of syntax form begins to behave itself in the space in front of you and that language may have existed a very long time before anybody got the idea that you could use a certain sound like glass to mean a certain complex object because on psilocybin uh, glossolalia is frequently triggered glossolalia is normally presented as speaking in tongues a religious phenomenon of fundamentalism and the fundamentalist spin on it is that these are ancient biblical languages and that you're being um, possessed by an angel or something but in fact at the primitive level of religion worldwide glossolalia is frequently met with and all of us have an ability to relax away from meaning and still retain syntax it's just something you would never do because we're programmed to always mean something when we speak but in fact babies don't do this at all they they love to babble and they only late in the process learn to attach meaning well so then under the under language in the humble service of meaning there is language uh for itself sort of the ding on sish of language and uh what's important is not how it sounds what's important is how it looks in the amazon in these ayahuasca cults they have what they call ikaros magical songs ikaros are uh visual art they are intended that way and they're criticized that way and their success or failure is judged entirely in the visual domain and yet they are made out of sound and what they convey are very complex 
feelings. You could almost say three-dimensional feelings. Feelings so complex that they won't lay down and be a sound like hate, fear, revulsion. They won't do that. They can only be laid out as grammatical objects of a higher order. And I think that um, this process is happening in human beings, the push toward visible language. But it's being accelerated by the psychedelics and that th we are trying to become for each other visual objects and we are trying to become uh, capable of generating these things. Now, why I hold these conclusions is because in the DMT flash, which is the most intense quintessence most quintessential distillation of this kind of stuff, you encounter the shamanic entities, the spirits, the ancestors. And this is really confounding. I mean, we can put up with shifting cobwebs of color and weird insights about our nostrils and our little fingers, but not entities. And yet, in that space, these things exist. And they're preaching this ontological transformation of language. This is how entities in hyperspace communicate. It's as though everything has had one dimension added on to it. It's as though we are existing in some kind of squashed version of a larger superspace that can simply be mentally unfolded through the act of encountering a psychedelic substance. I think it's big news that these entities exist. Uh, now, if you were to go to a shaman in a classical culture and say, what, what, what's, what's it about? What's going on here? They would unhesitatingly tell you that these are the ancestors. Say, oh, yes, these are the ancestors. We, work, we cure using the ancestors. And this is, I think, very unsettling for us as Westerners. It, we'd much rather accept the notion of friendly extraterrestrials communicating through the mushroom than that this is the dearly departed. I mean, that really, you can feel your boundaries beginning to quake against that possibility. It was very interesting. Recently, there was a new edition of... Uh, Evans Vince's The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, which if you've never read it, it's quite an interesting book. Y.E. Evans Vance was an American who became a great scholar of Mahayana Buddhism and wrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines, and so forth. But his doctoral thesis when he was a young folklore student at Cambridge in 1911 was he wanted to study the fairy faith and he went to Brittany and Wales and Ireland and interviewed the oldest people in the districts, the crones and the old, old people. And it's a wonderful uh, book to read because these people just tell these stories and it's absolutely convincing. I mean, the fairies are real, the fairy faith is real. And when you ask, when, when Evans Vance asked these people, you know, what's going on? They said, uh, well, these are dead. These are the dead. When you die, you you stay around, but you're in an invisible realm, and it's an ecology of souls. My phrase, not his, an ecology of souls. But this is what is revealed on DMT: is entities that are so strange that they could easily pass for extraterrestrials. What's puzzling about them is their tremendous humor and affection and intense involvement in us as human beings. Why are they there? What do they want? And they're not, uh, if they are ancestors, they're not my ancestors. In other words, when I broke in there, I didn't find my mother and my grandparents. It wasn't like that. There was no personal... It, it isn't like that. But there is this sense of uh, 
affection, interest, caring. Well, we have the doctrine of purgatory in Western theology in the Catholic Church. I had always assumed, thinking about it, that, that purgatory must have been a doctrine that the church fathers, Irenaeus and Eusebius and that crowd, had written into the, the gospel message for their own purposes. I discovered, to my amazement, that that isn't what happened at all, that St. Patrick is the person responsible for purgatory because he, he wrote purgatory into Christian doctrine in order to convert the Celtic peasantry of Ireland to the idea that fairyland and the Christian afterlife were the same place. And it was thought such a good idea in Rome that the doctrine became canon law generally for the church. So, so purgatory is a spruced up, cleaned up version of Irish fairyland to, to make it a little more palatable. Well, you see, we, th this is where our anxieties come in and where it, it's hard to push it much further than this. An extraterrestrial contact, I think we could probably ride that through and it would be amazing, but it would be tolerable. But if what's happening is that at the end of history are waiting the dead, and that our notion of reality is so skewed that we don't even know the most basic facts about the cycles of life and death and rebirth, then it's going to be uh, quite astonishing for us, I think, to come to terms with this. And yet, this is what, this is what shamans live with. This is they, what they tell you. They say, you know, a shaman is a person who can pass daily through the gates of death and return. We see into the other realm. We see into hyperspace. As inheritors of the rational tradition, this is pretty hard for us to swallow because I think, I mean, maybe it's not true anymore, but in my personal process of rejecting Catholicism, I did manage to convince myself that when you dead, it's over with. And it's been very hard for me to fight my way back to the notion that that might be just 100% malarkey and nothing more than a conservative first try. And now I think much more in terms of dimensionality and that I don't know what a form is, but the process of the fertilization of an egg, of any organism, it doesn't have to be a human being, the life of that organism, and then its death and dissolution, is the process of a form descending from hyperspace, clothing itself in matter, and then withdrawing from, from matter, returning to hyperspace. And this concept of hyperspace is very, very necessary to understanding this stuff. Because if you look at what shamans do that is so confounding, they find lost objects, they cure disease, they rescue lost souls, they discern uh, secret acts, infidelities, thefts, poisonings, stuff like that. All of these magical things that they do are completely non-mysterious if we grant the idea of a higher spatial dimension. I mean, if, if, we, if there's a higher spatial dimension, then, you know, this section is not zipped. There's a part of it which is completely open to the world. This room is not closed. There's one direction in which it's absolutely open to the air. In other words, in hyperspace, nothing is hidden. Yeah. 